chapter 8. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 7. We'll be looking at verses 7 through uh, 12. I can actually read verse 6 too. If you have a Bible in front of you, that's fine. Uh, if you don't have one, there are some in the pew rack. Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to pick up the reading in verse 6. We're thinking again about the heavenly dove. At least probably three uh, Wednesdays on this subject, maybe four. And it's just something the Lord kind of led me to do. And I prayed about whether it was to be Sundays or Wednesdays. And I felt pretty, pretty peaceful about leaving it for the midweek. So Genesis chapter 8. Again, we're thinking about the heavenly dove. Verse 6 and following. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in, came into him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. I have mentioned uh, in advance of this little series that it was a Wednesday night when I had this beautiful experience of seeing this dove um, alight on someone. I was right over here after the Lord's Supper. We were all just kind of praying up in front. And it was just like watching a pretty high definition film, a little mini vi vision. And um, it was a man, I would say, about 30s, mid-30s, uh, curly black hair, and he was standing kind of like this, and he had his hands like this, and he, he had his head bowed. And then I saw the, like the heaven open, and I saw this dove come, um, just as they described the dove coming upon Jesus, only it wasn't the kind of dove you see at Fountain Square. It wasn't the normal dove you would see flying or walking on the ground. As, as it got closer and closer, it was huge. I mean huge. Bigger than a man-sized uh, being. And when it came upon him, it was so tall and its wingspan so large that it was able to completely cover him and its head was higher than its head. So his, its shoulders draped the uh, wings over him, completely covered him, and the head was left there. And almost kind of like a cat, Black, black, he seems like he can spin his head 360, kind of like that. Um, that dove was just turning almost 360. And this is where language fails when you have an experience like this. I don't have words to describe the emotion of that dove. Um, it was something like to any enemy, don't even think about doing anything against this person. Um, and then I began to think of, of course, Scripture after Scripture. I, it's Psalm 91, I, I, I'm under the shadow of your wings. And the, the dove had kind of like reddish, fiery eyes. So it was like the best defensive program you could ever have. And that stayed with me. And, and when you have an experience like that, you'll find that it will do. And I can call that experience to, to mind anytime I want to. And I do especially if I'm having a difficult time. That's what I'm hoping you will do, especially after we look at some of these things we're looking at on these couple of Wednesdays. Um, you can call that picture up no matter where you are. You can, with your mind's eye, with your imagination, you can imagine those wings completely covering you, completely around you. No one and nothing can get past without his permission. And you can imagine him scanning the area around you, 360, looking for any hint of trouble. And he would, when the enemy comes in, as the Bible says, one way he will flee seven. 
So this has come back to me over and over lately because I know a number of people are facing various kinds of life challenges. And I thought it would be good to think about this concept of what a dove is and how a dove operates and so on, scripturally speaking. Um, I, the pigeon is, is from the same family as the dove, and, and I've gotten a lot of just kind of, if I'm at Fountain Square, I'll sit there, they'll get maybe a foot, no, no farther than a foot from you, you watch them eat and all that. And I look at those wings, and I look at that head, and I look at those eyes, and it brings that back again. And I think, well, how cool is this? Um, Jesus said that you and I are to be harmless as doves, right? Wise as serpents. And he's basically saying you need to be wise like the Holy Spirit. So this is a beautiful thing. I want you to look with me here. And please, if you have a bulletin or something, pen, pencil, dirty fingernail, write down any questions that come to your mind because there's a lot of material in here. And I'm, I'm trusting we can get through it in 30 minutes. I want to look at the situation. And then we want to look um, kind of close at the, the manifestation of this dove. Um, first, the situation. And the surrounding circumstances of this dove being sent forth. It was following a time of judgment. That's when the dove was sent forth after a time of judgment. And think about this. It was only seven chapters after an initial judgment that we read about in Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2, the earth became without Form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. Now, what's that about? I've mentioned this in a couple of my books. You may have read it somewhere in a commentary or somebody's book. This is describing the first assault made on heaven that we have recorded. And you read about it in Isaiah 14. Satan and a particular number of fallen angels that joined with him assaulted the throne of God. He was summarily put down. Jesus mentions this in Luke's gospel. Uh, the disciples came back and said, wow, this is fantastic. Even the demons are subject unto us through your word. He, he basically said, oh, that's nothing. I saw heaven fall. Uh, heaven. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He was referring to Genesis 1-2. What happened? Darkness, waste, formless void. And the Bible says there, and the spirit of God is brooding over the waters. Now, if you look that word up, brooding, you find it appears only two other times in the entire Old Testament. The first time it appears there besides Genesis 1-2 is Deuteronomy 32-11. What does it do there? It describes Yahweh. It describes our God and how he brought his people out of bondage in Egypt, just like a, a bird or an eagle fluttering over its young. Same word brooding, fluttering over the waters. Yahweh was bringing Israel out of bondage in Egypt as an eagle fluttering over its young, brooding over it. So here is that same picture of a bird uh, cherishing and, and protecting and providing for its young. And of course, this was followed by a new beginning, right? The earth that you and I are presently living on. Uh, right after Genesis 1-2, we find, and God said, light be, and light was. Light had al always been, but it had been clouded now by darkness, the darkness of judgment. Now, uh, notice that our text describes a second insurrection. This time it's not Satan and a host of fallen angels assaulting the very throne of God and what uh, the Bible calls in the New Testament, Uranus, the actual planet, if you will, heaven, the personal dwelling place of God. It's not that this time. It's something else. It's attacking humanity. This insurrection is directed at God, but it concerns you. It concerns me. It concerns humanity. It's not angel against God. It's angel against humanity. And you read about this a number of places. In the book of Genesis, for example, chapter 6, if you have your Bible open with you, in Genesis 6, two chapters earlier, verse 4, we read, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God, which is a phrase that's used six times in the Old Testament, always and only of angels, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, 
and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, men which were of old, men of renown, or men of the name. And this basically is where uh, Greek um, mythology comes from, uh, all these Greek gods, part man, part God type thing. And if you look at verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that even the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's what brought this judgment we're talking about tonight. Now, why on earth, assuming it could happen, why would these angels do this? Why would elect angels fall from grace and commit a particular sin, cohabit sexually with earthly women? Because of Genesis 3.15, the promise of Yahweh to Adam and Eve that he was going to send a seed who would crush the serpent's head. So the, these angels were trying to pollute the purity of the human race to keep the seed, Jesus, from being born. And that's why we have this worldwide judgment of the flood. Now... A lot of people say, well, this is crazy. Uh, where, where, where do you get this giant's business? I read a couple commentaries and it said, you know, the sons of God refer to this godly line of Seth and, and the, you know, the giants doesn't mean that at all. It just means they were warriors. You know what? You don't need to believe any of that to, to, to still understand that angels fell from grace and committed a particular sin, a sexual sin, that other fallen angels did not. Well, where's that, Pastor? If you have your Bible in front of you, turn to the book of Jude. I've talked to some people. For some reason, they just, they're just they uncomfortable when the Bible says something they find hard to believe or don't agree with. But you know what? Let's just forget Genesis for just a moment. Let's, let's move to the New Testament. Let's move to the letter written by the half-brother of the Lord Jesus who converted after the resurrection, and let's see what he says about this. Now, what I'm doing is quoting here from Professor Wiest's translation. Why? Because some translations, including the King James, leave out a phrase that is in the Greek text, and it makes a lot of difference when you leave it in there. Let me give you Professor Wiest's uh, version. This is Jude, the epistle of Jude, and uh, verses 6 and following. And angels who did not carefully keep inviolate their original position of preeminent dignity, but abandoned once for all their own private dwelling place, with a view to the judgment of the great day, in everlasting bonds under darkness, he has placed under careful guard. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner to these. That's the important word. The word these is a demonstrative pronoun in the text. It is not feminine to agree with cities. So Jude is not saying Sodom and Gomorrah were like the cities round about them that were committing this sexual impropriety. The word these here is not feminine to agree with the word cities. It's masculine to agree with the word angels. Back to Weist's translation. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner to these, the angels of verse 6, having given themselves over with a complete abandon to fornication and having gone after a different kind of flesh from their own, cohabiting with beings of a different nature, are being set forth as an example, undergoing the punishment of everlasting fire. So what is God saying, Pastor? God's word is saying angels committed fornication. The result was half human, half angelic fallen beings known as giants. It happened not once, but at least twice in the old covenant. Could it happen again? Well, funny you should ask that, because the pastor just won a first place award for an action screenplay about that very thing. A third outbreak, trying to prevent not the first coming of Christ, but the second coming. Coming to a theater near you as soon as the pastor can unload it 
on some, <laughs> on some brave company that wants to jump in and uh, enjoy the, the fun. I got talent attached and everything. So isn't this interesting? Now, I want to show you something else about this that, that kind of proves how important this concept is. Look at Genesis 6, verse 9. It says that Noah, in contrast to everyone else, Noah and his family only, in contrast to all of uh, humanity at the time, apparently, was blameless and righteous before the Lord. Now, righteous, of course, means they were godly. The word blameless does not mean morally good. If you study it out, the word blameless means physically good. It's used of animal sacrifices being unblemished. In other words, there's nothing wrong. They don't have six legs instead of four. There's nothing wrong with the eye. It's not physically blemished. How many are tracking with me? So what it means is Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives had a pure humanity, had not been part of this corruption that was going on round about them. So that was one reason that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Can I throw in something else free? When it says he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, it doesn't mean like the old uh, laugh-in show, fickle finger of fate, you know, boom, you're it. It means literally he sought grace. It's not that he found grace. In other words, ah, Noah, my good man. Yeah, Yahweh did think that, of course, because he was still a human person. But it was also the fact that it's active there. Noah was seeking God's grace. He was seeking deliverance. How would you feel if you and your kinfolk were the only pure humans left in a godless earth and everybody else, all they could do and think about was evil continually, not just once in a while? How many think it, it would be hell to be driving all the time? It, it, isn't a one or two hour drive too much with these idiots on the road today? How would you like that 24 seven with no escape? You're constantly driving. You're trying to make a turn off. Someone sees you're gonna make a turn, what do they do? They come to your left and pass you before you can make the turn so they're in front of you and don't have to wait. Wow, oh, nobody does that. Just happened to me today. <laughs> on the, my own business is trying to get downtown. Is this helping anybody? Isn't this something? The second judgment, the flood, was not because of angel, fallen angel against God directly, but, against, but fallen angels against mankind to prevent the coming of the seed. So let's look at the manifestation now of the, the, the dove coming forth. Just follow along with me again uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 8. And he sent out the raven, speaking of Noah, he sent out the raven, and it went out, going out and returning, until the waters from on the earth are drying. There's an article there. It's almost though, as though it's a particular raven that Noah had set aside for this job. A just like as we're going to see, it, there was a particular dove. Do you notice that the raven didn't return? It came and went. It came and went. It came and went. Why? Why would that be? Unlike a dove, a raven is a carnivore. A raven could and would feast on dead meat. Now, symbolically, what would the raven likely symbolize? Picture of the enemy. Picture of the enemy and his crowd. According to Jesus, Satan and his ministers do one thing and one thing only. Steal, kill, and destroy. And if they can, they destroy eternally. John 10, verse 9. Let's continue. And he sent the dove from him to see if the waters, they were abated from the surface of the ground. And the dove, it found not a resting place for the sole of its foot. So it returned to him into the ark because of waters on the surface of all the earth. Everybody say all the earth. Yeah, this is not a small flood. It's not a one area flood. This is a worldwide flood over all the earth. And if you study it out, almost every people group has a legend or a story about a flood. It was that cosmic in its importance. Because of the waters 
were on the surface of all the earth, and he put out his hand, and he was taking it. That word it there is emphatic. Again, he probably had this particular dove, this particular bird, set aside to test the waters, pun intended. He was taking it, and he was bringing it into the ark. Now, why? Because the dove was not a carnivore like the raven and could not exist on prey. Now, you think about this. We know from the New Testament example of the Lord Jesus, all four Gospels talk about the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. The dove, not a carnivore like the raven, unable to exist on prey. In the same way, the Holy Spirit cannot come and rest upon or abide or continue or stay eternally on an unsaved person. An unbeliever cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Now this should be helpful to some people in the body of Christ. Some entire denominations tell you, tell me, tell seeking people that one thing about it, when you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit and that's all of the Holy Spirit you'll ever receive. Is that right? Not according to Jesus. Jesus in, his, in the Gospel of John said, I'm going to give you another comforter whom the world cannot receive. So the world does not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the heavenly dove, the being that came upon the Lord Jesus, the one that came upon that young believer, whoever he was in my vision here. We receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit when we're born again, but he in his person does not alight and remain upon spiritually dead or sinful human beings. The, the, the raven, the carnivore, feasts on dead meat. The enemy tries to feast on unsaved, spiritually dead humanity, and he does it, and he's good at it. And if no one stops him, he'll continue doing it. Now let's, let's move to this manifestation. Look at verse 11. Genesis 8, verse 11. That tells us that Noah waited seven more days before he sent the dove out again. And I found this interesting. The 70, the Greek version, has seven eteras. Seven eteras. The word eteras means different days. Not just like the ones that preceded this. These are different days. Um, it was in the, uh, this would likely mean less water than the previous one. Does that make sense? He sent the dove out again in seven different days. The water was lower again. And then we'll see he did it yet again. The waters were again lower. They were different to the other two weeks. And will you notice in verse 11, it was in the evening that the dove returned. And when it came back this time, it had an olive branch in its mouth. The dove itself and the olive, olive branch, even today, are symbolic of what? Peace. We hear about countries that are negotiating, that have been at war or whatever, and uh, this, this prime minister wants to extend the olive branch. The idea is we're going to have peace between us, at least uh, in a limited way. And this is what happened. It returned with the olive branch, uh, meaning peace had come. Now, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. He sent it out, and it was evening when it came back. And according to the scripture, it was evening all over the world when Jesus died at three in the afternoon on what we call Good Friday. There was darkness all over the earth. It was a supernatural darkness. And the death of Christ brought peace to wayward humanity. So here it is again. After that, after he came back with the olive branch in its beak, and he, Noah, was waiting again seven days, same thing, seven eteras, seven different days later. Then he sent out the dove, but it did not return to him again. Now, I find this extremely thought-provoking, and I hope you find it the same way, encouraging. I almost read right over it, but the word return, he sent it out, and it did not return to him, is perfect tense. It means the dove went out, 
and remained out. Absolutely did not come back. Now again, the Holy Spirit, according to the four Gospels, is, symbol, is symbolized by a dove. And Jesus says that the Holy Spirit, when he comes to his people, not to sinners, not to lost people, to, not the world, but to his children, when the Spirit of the Lord comes in fullness to his children, he doesn't come and go. I don't know how many sermons I've read or services I've been in, when they give an altar call for people to get saved, they, they give an altar call for people to get uh, healed or, or maybe d delivered from dark forces, and then they'll, they'll have uh, an altar call for people to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then they'll give another altar call for Christians that want a refilling. As though fullness can somehow be added to fullness. Or as though once we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's great, we're full then, but we leak. This makes no sense at all. I'll never forget it. I was working the Christian radio, and I was on the afternoon show. I had, I had some music on, and a friend of mine called, and she was lit up like a Christmas tree on the phone. And she said, praise God, I got a dose. I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, what happened? She said, I went to so-and-so's revival. I said, oh, that's great. I said, uh, what, what, what happened? I said, you're, you're, you've been saved a long time. Haven't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, for years. I said, well, what happened? Well, I, I, he gave the altar call and, and, and he said, if you want a refilling, come on down. And I'm thinking again, what, what do you mean refilling? Did you leak? Well, I don't understand this. And he, she said, so I went down there and he touched me and I fell out and I was laying on the carpet for about 30 or 40 minutes talking in tongues. And when I got up, I felt like a million dollars. And I think she had, she had driven about two or three hours to go to that meeting to get something she already had. She could have, had, just, she could have just sat in a recliner at home without the three-hour drive, without anybody pushing her on the, on the, the floor, and just close her eyes and talk in tongues for as long as she wanted. <laughs> she had had the same experience. But I didn't want to dampen her spirits or rain on her parade. So I said, well, that's wonderful, darling. Just keep doing what you're doing. But think about this. The Bible doesn't say he comes and goes. He comes and stays. John 14, 16. I'll pray the Father. He'll give you another comforter, another alos, just like me, that he may abide with you for how long? Till you miss Sunday worship. Till you miss your daily Bible reading. He'll stay with you how long? Till you lose your temper. No. The Bible says he'll stay with you forever. This is, this is the last thing, and I quit. Well, I did it, 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. Here's another one. You can write this down if you want. There are several others, but this one is a nice one. In Acts 10.45, Acts 10.45, you read that Peter had preached to the household of Cornelius. They had already heard the gospel. He tells them the gospel, which you know, the way he said that, they had heard it a while ago with the result that they still knew it. And they got so thrilled that what they had believed they received was really theirs. The Holy Ghost fell on them without anybody praying for them. They were just lacking assurance. They, had, they were already saved, but they, they were brought into a place of confirmation. And some liturgical churches even call the experience of the baptism in the Holy Ghost confirmation. I think uh, Erica went to uh, Anglican Church. Don't they still call that confirmation? Yeah, Catholics, some high Lutheran churches, these high Lutheran churches, high Methodists even, some of them call it confirmation. That's what it means. They were confirmed in their faith. They didn't get the faith, and they were already saved, but they were confirmed. And here's what it says. The, 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 those around them said, wow. So they found out now that the Holy Ghost had been poured out on the Gentiles too. That verb, poured out, is perfect tense. Not aorist. It happened at a point in time, but we don't know what happened after that. Not imperfect. He was continually being poured out on them, and we don't know how long that lasted. No. Perfect. It, he came at a point in time and remained. Isn't that good news? He never goes anywhere. When you go out, when you leave tonight, if you've got to drive or whatever, if it's raining, you don't have to wonder, oh, gosh, I should have prayed. I wonder if he's busy. Maybe he's answering somebody else's prayer. Uh, I don't, can the Holy Spirit be in two places at once? Well, if he's going to take care of that wreck, how's he going to take care of mine? Am I naked now? Am I on my own? No. 
You just call that picture I gave us tonight. Remember, the Spirit of God has you completely enfolded in his wings, as it were. He's taller than you are. He can see farther than you can. He's more powerful than you or I will ever be. And he's got everything under control. He doesn't come. He doesn't go. He comes and he stays just like this dove. When he went the last time after he had come with the olive branch, there was peace on the earth. The judgment had brought peace. The judgment of the fall uh, of these angels and the corruption of the human race had been judged. He came and he was able to stay. And when Jesus died at Calvary, uh, the judgment fell and humanity was saved. God was no longer counting mankind's trespasses against them. All we have to do is RSVP the invitation. And he's abiding with us forever. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? He, he came on the day of Pentecost. He continues to fall upon people that he hasn't already equipped. And once he, once he comes, he never leaves. I don't know whether you saw this or not, but I mentioned it in a sermon or two. But it's, I might even talk about this later in another one of these lessons. But when you read that the Holy Ghost falls on people, you see that phrase in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost fell on them, meaning filled them or uh, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the same identical phrase. He falls on us as the prodigal son's father. He ran to him and embraced him. It's the same. It's the same Greek word, and I don't know about you, but any spiritual experience I have or supernatural, I test it against God's word. We should always do that. Uh, as wonderful as experiences are, if they're not backed up by the word or the, the word, if they go contrary to the word, just toss them. But when I saw that, that's exactly what was being pictured symbolically, that the wings were completely surrounding that person. And that's exactly what happens. Just like the prodigal son's dad's arms completely encircled him. He fell upon him. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Now, the difference, of course, is he, he eventually stepped back, didn't he? The old man, he stepped back. Can you imagine the smell? I'm sure he loved the kid, but, you know, I guess one hug would be enough probably until he got stink, the stink off. Then he got him the, the shoes and the ring and the, the, the robe and so on. But the difference when the Holy Spirit falls upon us and hugs us, he doesn't stop. And it's, that's the awesome part. Now, I didn't say you'd always feel it. I didn't say anything about feeling. It's not about feeling. It's about fact. Um, and, but it, it, if you believe the fact, you'll have a better feeling about life. I can tell you that. So I think this is a good starting point for this little mini-series about the heavenly dove. And there's some beautiful truth there. And I, I don't think we've... We've gotten too symbolic. I think we're backing things up with the word. Any questions about any of this? Mike? Wow. Do we know how many people were on earth when the flood came? Not that I know of. That's an excellent question. What does it mean all humanity yeah, was corrupted? Yeah. It would, it would have to be thousands. It would, I think it would have to be thousands. But, yeah, how many? I, I, I don't know of anybody that knows. Maybe someone's done research somehow, figured it out. But, yeah, it wasn't a handful. Uh, the very fact that Noah is pointed out as different, you know, different from, I would say, from thousands, perhaps more than that. Um, but a staggering concept. And, and I'm glad these things are recorded. Um, people can look up Jude 6 and following you don't, you know, people that are upset about the sons of God and this and that, and the Old Testament, refer Testament reference doesn't matter. Um, the other thing about the, the Jude thing, I don't think I mentioned it, but it, it bears mentioning. It says of these particular angels who left their own estate and cohabited with earthly women, it says they're in eternal chains. Now think about that. How many have heard of Christians casting demons out of people? Yeah. And how many have heard about principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this present air around us? Of course. Well, why in the world are these angels bound? These fallen angels, these demons, why are they bound when all these other demons are able to inhabit people and 
you know, rule over cities and because they committed a particular sin that the other fallen angels did not. I'll throw this one in free of charge since we're in, we're in overtime now, <laughs> extra innings. But I thought this was cool. My sister-in-law, she wouldn't mind me saying this, my sister-in-law, Carol, uh, got saved not too long after um, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, she's married to Barb's brother. Carol had known very little about the Bible. She was a new Christian, but she had a dream one night, and in the dream, the Lord took her to hell just to show her what he had rescued her from and so that she'd have it in mind when she's witnessing to people what she's trying to save them from. And, and she said as she went about these different places in hell, she went through one particular area, and as she walked by, this demon's hand came out to grab her. And, but he couldn't. He had a chain. He was chained to the wall, and he couldn't quite reach her. And she said she had the feeling he had sexual intentions. That was that kind of reaching, not to steal money or a purse or something. It was a, a sexual thing. And she said he was, he was bound. He had these chains. She said, what in the world would that dream mean? And I told her about this scripture. And you talk about somebody's faith soaring. She was just lit up when she found out. She had a supernatural dream describing something that's written in the Bible. And she said, it's real, it's real, it's real. And she said, you don't want to go there and you don't want to see those beings at all because it wasn't cool. And she was so glad the Lord was only showing her so she'd have some gun power, gun, gun power, I guess, spiritually to witness to people. Anybody else? Mike, go for it. Oh, okay. Um, did, the, did the intermingling of the angels cause the bad thoughts that ripple through humanity? Sure, yeah. Did, did, if the angels didn't do that, would it just be status quo? Yeah, the, 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 the those angels and so on cause the, the, the imaginations of the heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we see this in the New Testament. When Ananias lied about the money that he sold his field for, oh, we're giving it all to the Lord, you know. And Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie about this? You're not lying to man, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. So, yeah. And in the Old Covenant, Job says to his comforters, Whose spirit came from you? Whose words are you speaking and whose spirit came from you? So, yeah. Uh, and Paul talks about it in Ephesians. The imaginations of our heart are dark. Uh, it, it, I think we would be absolutely amazed if we had our eyes opened to how often dark forces are putting thoughts in our mind. Thoughts of envy, thoughts of anger, thoughts of whatever, anything that's not fruit of the Spirit. I think we'd be absolutely amazed. They're busy. That's why Paul says to, you know, to the Ephesians regarding anger, which is a big door opener, if you want to call it that. Um, don't, don't go to bed angry. Don't let anger abide. It's, it, it, stop giving room, he says, to the devil. So anger and rebellion are the two main doorways that people let evil spirits have access to them. That means they're, they're going to hell, it, but it means their Christian life is not going to be fun. So, yeah, Erica. Yes. That's right. That's what the scripture says. Yeah. Peace is the opposite. Yeah. That's right. You're, you're agitated. There's no peace there. So, um, talks about those things. I, you know, I had people when I was newly saved say you can't watch science fiction movies or, you know, because they open doors, you know. You, you can't find scripture an inch long for any of that, but the Bible does talk about two doors that are actually in the scripture. One is rebellion toward God's constituted authority, whoever that might be. Rebellion is you're actually being taken over by the enemy and used for his purposes. The other is anger, opens, gives the devil place in your life. So think about it. Isn't that good news? Just be in an attitude of submission, whether it's in, in the church or whether it's government or whatever. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody, like everybody, but you're in submission. And the other thing is anger. It doesn't mean you don't feel anger, but you don't act on it, and you let it go on a regular basis. You know, Think of how much trouble we can save ourselves by living that way. 
if you're giving tonight, that's great. We have baskets here, one in the hall, and we're going to come around the Lord's table. Has this helped anybody tonight? I think this will be fun to finish this out. So we'll, we'll have probably at least two more, maybe three, but at least two more. Uh, we'll be looking a little bit more about, about uh, guidance and how the Lord looks after us in this dove manifestation.